So um, I'll also just disclaim right off the bat that um, I should have taken a leaf out of Teddy's book and uh, used my own computer because the formatting is all screwy, so the, the slides will be awful. Hopefully what I have to say will be of interest. Um, the, the title that you just saw was bestowed on me by our absent friend Noah. This is the title that I'm using instead because it's actually a little closer to the mark of, it's, it's sort of a subset, I suppose, of the crowd of crowds, open tools for open societies. The specific thing that I want to think with you about this morning is opening space for analog crowdsourcing. Now that kind of has a double meaning which I don't need to explain right off the bat, but the reason to open space for that in this conversation is I think because we risk being mesmerized by the digital understandably and with good reason. Um, but there are, uh, there are modes of operation, of collaboration, of bringing intelligence and hard work and, and hands to execute it together um, that are physical and may or may not involve computers at all. And those should be part of our thinking in, in uh, examining the potentials for crowdsourcing also. So I, I'm a futurist. Uh, I work for a global uh, design and engineering firm called Arup. You may or may not heard of Arup, uh, have heard of Arup, but you've probably seen some of the projects that we've worked on over the last 67 years. Um, we're an employee-owned company, which means we are independent, um, which means that when we say we shape a better world, that's our, uh, that's our company mission, um, mo most of the time we can say it with a straight face, uh, which is no mean feat, actually, in today's corporate environment. So, um, and on the left side of this picture are some of the, um, some of the projects closer to home uh, that, we've, that we've worked on recently. But I can't take credit for any of that. I'm not an engineer. I'm not an architect. What I am is a futurist, which <clears throat> I need to clarify, because uh, futures work may readily be misunderstood. Or actually, no, it, it can be perfectly well understood, but carried out in a totally different way from the way that, that I like to do it, um, which is to say that I don't go around the place telling people what the future is and that they should do X, Y, and Z to prepare for it. To me, the heart of this work is actually about uh, the design and staging or facilitation of processes which bring out of the woodwork, out of the particip participation uh, pool, whoever the people may be that we're working with, whether that be um, uh, internally, because 50% of my job is sort of focused internally, um, and 50% is external on our clients and partners, but whoever it may be, the point of it all is to set up processes that let people map, understand, and navigate possible futures more strategically than they might otherwise be able to. Now, I want to invoke here um, a kind of mantra from the open source world, not to be confused with open space, but uh, no doubt um, people here have quite a lot of familiarity with open source as a way of making software. Open space is a way of running meetings. But the, the resemblance, which I think goes to the roots of crowdsourcing that Teddy uh, promised I would talk about. And um, this, this kind of um, uh, aphorism from Eric Raymond, who wrote The Cathedral and the Bazaar, kind of one of the Bibles of, of uh, open source thinking, says, with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow, which is sort of a... Um, next generation version of something that we saw in the background of Jen from NASA's uh, presentation. She had a slide that said, um, th that referred to the challenge of bringing more minds uh, around a problem in order to solve it. That's what open source as a way of dealing with software is intended to do. But there is an analogy to be made between that mentality, collective, collaborative mentality and structure for working, and the collective collaborative mentality and structure for work that is at, that is at stake when we talk about co-designing or co-creating the future. So this is my friend Jame Cascio, uh, who's, uh, who's a futurist over at Institute for the Future in Silicon Valley. And he says, with enough minds, all tomorrows are visible, rather than with enough eyes, all bugs are shallow. So we can use this, invoke this kind of collaborative way of operating, not just to make software better, but to change the world. And that sort of sets the groundwork for, for what I want to say about, um, about open space. So crowdsourcing, I, I, before we depart this sort of general thing about crowdsourcing, this is from uh, the front page of the website for this event, which says crowdsourcing is the new practice of harnessing collaboration for problem solving, uh, innovation, and efficiency. It is based on loose and open networks of both amateurs and professionals powered by new technologies, social media, and Web 2.0. I've underlined the words new there because I want to ask and really just make this a rhetorical question for you to, uh, to chew on. How new is it? 
Certainly elements of it are very new, but there's no question that we've been collaborating and working together and trying to make the most of what we each bring to the table for a very long time. And so if we relax the kind of technology, and I mean high technology, gadgetry, social media, Web 2.0, the things evoked in that definition, if we relax the technology-driven way of imagining crowdsourcing, where does that get us? Well, hopefully not to this, but I, I've, I have this um, slide up here because it, in a way it sort of encapsulates um, one of the sadder aspects of how we traditionally operate when it comes to strategic discussion. There are highly routinized white papers and outputs and very um, orderly and choreographed and programmed meetings that we have when we come together. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm invoking a general wiki here. I think um, looking around, people recognize that this is a way that, that oftentimes organizations run themselves in a fashion that isn't particularly inspired or inspiring. So enter open space technology, which th the term technology here is actually used tongue in cheek um, because it, it's a way of organizing things socially. It doesn't involve um, anything with transistors inside it. Um, but open space technology, can I just get a show of hands? How many people here have heard of open space technology? Please put your hand right up. Okay, yeah, it looks like, keep, keep it up please. Um, okay, and um, keep your hand up now if you have participated in an open space event or an unconference. Open space event or unconference? Yeah, okay, seems like about, okay, when I add unconference, people get that. And then keep your hand up if you have actually organized an event like that or been involved in the organization. Of, okay, so we, yeah, a handful of people, great. So there's a differential sort of familiarity with this concept. Um, I don't want to labor the point, but I will, um, I will try to bring everybody up to at least a baseline in terms of what we're talking about here. So open space is a way of organizing meetings, okay? It doesn't necessarily involve computers in, in any way, although it can and, and they're, they're very useful for a certain purpose. This, this quote is kind of the nub of a story um, from the uh, progenitor, the discoverer, as he puts it, of open space rather than the inventor because in his view this is something that we've been doing for a very long time but just forgot how to do, um, at least uh, in corporate culture in the West. So his question, um, after, after spending a year, this is back in the early 80s, he spent a year organizing a conference for 250 people, vast amount of work as you can imagine, and at the end of it the best parts, according to him and all the feedback that he received, the best parts were the coffee breaks. Now, that's a, that's a little bit depressing. I mean, it, I don't know if you find that, um, I don't know, disappointing, but if you'd spent a year organizing an event, you may well uh, you know, sort of wonder why you'd put all that time and effort into doing something that didn't pay off remotely as much as the, that you put zero time and effort into, um, where you just let people uh, follow their passions. So the question that he has here is, how do you combine the excitement of a good coffee break with the productivity of a good meeting? And could you do it in, you know, with less than a year of organizing? And so uh, within a few years of that, open space technology had emerged as a way of, uh, of attempting to marry those, those two aspirations. Essentially what it is is a way of organizing meetings so as to elicit the best contributions of everyone present. Now, I should, I should add, I'm casting this as an example of analog crowdsourcing. I'm not suggesting that it's the only example. It may not even be the best example, but I think it is one of the most potent, and I think it's one of the most relevant um, in terms of understanding what is at stake underneath our collective enthusiasm for this concept and for this whole way of doing things. So that, that's, that's kind of the reason we're talking about this. Um, anyway, on with the story. So it's a structure for collaboration, essentially. Now, what happens? Okay, some of you know, some of you don't. So, you have a circle of chairs. The participants come into the circle. The, the facilitator welcomes them. This is the agenda at the start of the meeting. It's a blank wall. Now, there is a purpose to the meeting. That's what, that's what has brought everybody into the <coughs> space. Is that a, phone, a call from God? What, what's going on? <laughs> am, I, am I running too long? All right, I'll try to speed this up. Um, that's the agenda at the start of the meeting. That's the agenda after 40 minutes. This was with a group, incidentally, of, uh, of 20 to 30 Singaporean public servants. Now, I, I emphasize this because it goes to the question that someone asked over here a moment ago um, in relation to Teddy's presentation about the cross-cultural applicability of some of these formats. Um, in my experience, 
if the facilitation is skillfully done, it doesn't matter where the people are from or how uh, reticent they may usually be. But in any case, people co-create the agenda, they sign up for sessions, they break into the groups, self-select into the groups around the topics that they have nominated for themselves, and they spend the day in productive conversation, just the same way you do in the coffee breaks, meeting the people who you want to meet, talking to the people who you want to talk to, and solving the problems that you came there to solve. And that can take all sorts of different forms. You know, th there are groups of different sizes and compositions and uh, micro-facilitation formats, I suppose, because the participants themselves take on responsibility for how they run their sessions and what they do. And these, these are all shots from the same process. And uh, I should also disclaim that all, all, all but one photo in this presentation were just shots on my iPhone. So they're, they're not meant to be kind of beautiful eye candy. They're just meant to help you build a mental model of, uh, of, uh, of how this process works in case you haven't seen it. The reason I include this picture is because it's typical for an open space process to in include the participants actually typing up the proceedings of their conversations during the event so that by the time people leave, everybody has in their hand or in their email inbox a record of what happened. Now that is significant. That's significant because that never ever happens in, the, uh, in, in your standard format of collaboration. And you can you know, figure out for yourself what the uh, knock-on effects are for um, fueling um, the next steps and enabling collaborations to emerge out of those events. So how does it work? Well, really briefly, you've just seen how it looks. How does it work? There are basically two components. I won't go over the, There are four principles of open space, but um, you'll hear about those in a sec. There's one rule, actually, there's, and it's, it's only one, and it's called the law of two feet. And it is that if at any point during this whole process you find that for whatever reason you're not learning or contributing in the way that you would like, or if you're just not in the session that you want to be in, or if you need to go to the bathroom, or if you need a cup of coffee, whatever the reason, invoke the law of two feet and move yourself. Now, this sounds like stupidly simple. I even bother to mention it. Well, because in almost every other official form of collaboration where we come together, there is a stigma attached to, to going where you want to go. You, uh, all of us have been hostages to presentations that we didn't want to hear. Um, and uh, I mean, I, I, I'll invite you, invoke the law of two feet now <laughs> if, if I'm going on too long. But um, this, this essentially is the, is the core. Um, it's not even an innovation. It's just a, a social permission to spend your time in the most high value way that you can think of. Dead simple, and yet this is non-standard. This is still non-standard in most organizations. So the net effect of all of that is passion is what Harrison Owen, the founder who I referred to earlier, um, what he describes as passion bounded by responsibility. And open space uh, or OST has come to the fore in the work that I do. As I say, this is just one of many uh, ways of bringing people into conversation about the future, but it's come to the fore with a vengeance recently in the last sort of nine months or so. And I want to just briefly take you through a few examples of where it has applied and why, so that you can see what I'm talking about in terms of the value of, uh, of this type of uh, neo-analog collaboration. Now, it, the next slide is meant to be a film, and I'm told that it may or may not work. Okay, well, I'll, I'll say um, a word or two then while we're trying to pause this show and segue into the video. Thank you, Laura Feats. Good to see you being used. Um, the... Uh, the examples that you're about to see are all from uh, engagements which came about as a result of people wanting help with strategic, complex problems facing their organizations. And as you'll see, there are all kinds of organizations, and uh, this is one from August last year. Will it just play automatically? Whoever comes is the right people. Whenever it starts is the right time. Whatever happens, is the only thing that could have. And when it's over, it's over. We put out an expression of interest for people who are interested in talking about and exploring Melbourne's digital future. And 400 people who said that we're in this room. I think you want to connect with people who've got some energy. Dogs out there want to get out to the world, and we're going to make fire out to you. Digital festival. A small field of engagement out of crowd 
If people from each of the groups will uh, get feedback from the sessions that they have, and their ideas will be reinforced. That's what, it, what it's about. And what we need to do is have as many brands as possible thinking about it. We have all kinds of data, and we can't possibly know what is the best use of that data. Socially included, and um, for me, coming today was really important to make sure that that's a consideration. And actually, connections are going on outside of council, which is some of the things that we do. But on the other hand, it has to feed back to our policies and has to feed back into the next strategies we develop. I'm very pleased to see so many of you taking part, as many of you are in the vanguard of a rapidly changing business and nature landscape. They give the feeding artists about that much of the street to visualize that previous day. The idea is to, is to work with um, the city of Melbourne and other councils to help guide what they want. It is an ongoing dialogue, and as the pace of change actually itself accelerates, uh, you actually need to increase the communication as opposed to decrease it. Well, I, I think there's a definite buzz in the room, and I think that's because people are pretty passionate about this topic. So very interesting to understand what the city of Melbourne is doing. I'm sure we're going to get some good ideas that will help us with that as well. Okay, so that, that should give you a little bit of an idea of um, how a particular um, open space engagement can look and feel. The purpose of that one was for the City of Melbourne to begin to crowdsource a digital strategy for itself because it realised that in the era of the digital a lot of uh, things are going on that it doesn't even know about, let alone have a, have a particular hand in. So to Teddy's point about co-designing with citizenry, um, this was actually the first time that they had used um, a participant-centred live engagement process for anything. And a month later when we met with them they described it as an epiphany. So this is clearly a shift in uh, mentality, certainly for, um, for a subset of, uh, of governments, but I think also for other kinds of organisation. You've already seen some pictures before from the Singaporean government um, process where we were brought in last year to identify and test the assumptions underpinning what they call the blueprint for Singapore out to 2030 in terms of its livability and sustainability. Very, br very big, uh, very difficult and sort of at, at times intractably large um, interdisciplinary conversations that need to happen there. But uh, in the closing circle, when we finished the process, every single person who said something remarked on how surprised they were at how much they had been able to achieve. Because in stark contrast to the usual way of organising their collective activity, it was actually enjoyable. Um, another example from just over a month ago, uh, I, I facilitated a process for the leadership of Oxford University to help them begin to develop a digital strategy um, for the university as a whole. Which are, this is the original old school. Okay? These are not people who are typically accustomed to this type of openness and this type of participation. When they walked in and saw this circle of chairs, there were more than a few worried looks on people's faces. But within an hour, they were all off and away. And the point is that, you know, organisations even that don't think that they, can, uh, that, they, that they are capable of changing how they operate are, but it takes a certain amount of, uh, of, paradoxically, of leadership from the top to enable the bottom up to occur. And then the final example I want to give, because we've, we've already seen public sector and, uh, and university, this is private sector and this is my own organisation. So Arab Australasia is 1,500 people out of the uh, 10,000 that we have within the firm uh, globally. And for every two years we come together, it's essentially Arab's annual general meeting, but it happens every two years and we don't have shareholders because as I said before, we are an independent firm. So it's an internal conversation. Um, for, the, for the first time we came together in open space and there was a lot of trepidation around that. Um, this was the circle. I should add, um, this is how the room looked when I, when I walked in. Now, this is interesting, I think, it's sort of indicative. Um, we did this at the, uh, at the Marriott on the Gold Coast. And, 
And I told them, I don't know how many times, a big circle, you know, a round thing like this. And when I walked in, they were square. it was a square with, you know, kind of rounded edges. <laughs> and I was speaking to the, uh, to the facilities manager who, um, who's been there for 19 years. And I said, surely you've, you know, had requests for, for large circles before. And he said, I can't think of any occasion when we have. Small circles, you know, like uh, small group things, which, uh, which is what this breaks up into. But uh, um, although open space has been around since 1985, it is non-standard. And that's one of the reasons why I wanted to put it on our radar collectively for this conversation. Because it is, it's, it's not the sole example, but it's an, important, um, it's an important example that goes to the analog counterpart to what we're talking about today. So this was the agenda, these were the kinds of conversations, people doing calisthenics, it was very exciting. Um, this, having a group of principals of the firm who normally don't even, you know, don't necessarily write their own emails, typing up um, their, uh, the, the notes of their sessions so that they would be captured in their own words and take ownership of the outcomes, that was a significant development. And, and it led to, as you can see here, this is the newsroom off in the corner. If we want to talk about crowdsourcing, at the end of this process, there was a 120-page report. Now, I'm not suggesting that a 120-page report is a good thing, but it is indicative of the, um, of the volume that was able to be captured and documented, which in a, in a sense was really just a reflection of the productivity of the conversations themselves, which is where the real change occurred. So the outcomes, at a bare minimum, for, uh, for a process like this would be knowledge of the domain that you're looking at because you're uh, calling, it, uh, calling it forth to bubble up from across the community involved. Community, reinstatement or the creation of a community around the, around the question of interest. And inspiration, which might sound like a ludicrous deliverable, but think about it. If you bring people invitationally together who care about something to talk about the thing that they care about in relation to that overarching frame, they inspire each other. And these are the attributes of, of the process, the efficiency, productivity, solidarity, and cooperation. These are, the, are probably three of the main things that Fordist, Taylorist, kind of Newtonian um, production line and you know, uh, Robert's Rules of Order style meetings are meant to try to generate, but in fact do not. So a little bit of self-organization can go a long way. To the extent that you set the right conditions, you can actually get to, uh, and that would include duration. Um, you can't, you know, kind of reinvent an entire society or organization at scale in one day, but you can, get, you can um, make some good inroads. And if you allow three or more days, you can, you can actually do that stuff. So the conversations and decisions would have been pre-programmed are, are now owned by participants. There are other applications we could talk about, like Boeing redesigning its aircraft doors using this process, or AT&T redesigning uh, its um, uh, pavilion for the 1996 Olympics in three days after a 10-month planning process was overturned by a change in, in parameters. But the point is, process, this process and processes like it actually work in the conditions that are least hospitable to our default settings for collective work. Serious issues of mutual concern, complexity, diversity, conflict, either actual or, or potential in the background, and urgency, these are the factors that skittle or, or steamroll or destroy the intentions of, of, uh, of all too many boardroom meetings and uh, conventional summits, as, uh, as we'll all be aware from our different domains. This isn't magic, it's just self-organization at work. And those five attributes uh, compare eerily well to the five attributes which are the conditions for life emerging in the universe, as articulated by Stuart Kaufman in his book, At Home at the Universe. This is paraphrased by Harrison Owen. But it's, it's about taking our cue from natural processes and trying to uh, you know, replicate those aspects of them which let them thrive. So why should this matter to you? Well, hopefully that's already kind of clear. Um, but I think it's likely that even in very progressive organizations, and uh, the fact that you're here suggests that you may be one of them, um, progressive organizations interested in crowdsourcing, the default settings for how people physically come together are like, may, may well be unexamined. They may, may well not have been particularly um, carefully thought through. Into, and, and again, this is one of, of many possibilities. In some cases, consultation and collaboration are the exception to the rule. Why wouldn't you use this for every meeting? Well, you know, this is an, an infomercial. I'm just trying to open up some space for a, for a conversation um, that would otherwise be lacking. But because it's giving away power is scary and, and uh, frankly, quite rare, that's the hardest part of doing this work, I would suggest. 
And it's not always appropriate. And if you know what needs to be done, just go and do it. Um, so, you know, you wouldn't run an army uh, in open space, at least not in battle. But I think the bigger picture, which I wanted to sort of gesture to before leaving here, is a, 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 there's a sea change occurring in people's expectations of governance. And you've already heard um, uh, some examples of those. That, you know, I don't need to go into them. Um, it's techno technological to a certain extent. I mean, that's sort of maybe um, among the principal underlying drivers, but it's also cultural and generational. Because, as Marshall McLuhan said, we shape our tools and thereafter our tools shape us. And this is, this is part of the process of our tools coming back to shape us and change our thinking about how we come together to get things done. So let's be careful not to make crowdsourcing just broadcasting in reverse. And the, the final point I want to make is to situate something Teddy said in relation to this other framework. The International Association of Public Participation has this sort of five-part um, spectrum of ways of organizing collective activity. There's inform on the left, then consult, involve, collaborate, or empower. Inform is, we'll tell you what we decide. Empower is, you tell us what you decide and we'll do it. And in between is designing with. But I, I mention this not because you're expected to see all of that, but because if this is interesting to you, the IAP2 spectrum is well worth looking at because it applies not just to public sector organisations, but to any collective activity where you're trying to enlist people in co-creating something. And what excites me about this, this whole sort of sea change that I'm referring to is the possibility for genuine participation and actual self-rule. That is what makes crowdsourcing interesting as, as a kind of emergent element of our public discourse at this moment in time. And with that, thank you for your attention.